This is a passage of much love from Lamentation 3, just very appropriate in our time, speaking of God's character and how it is constant and consistent. God's Word says, Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will have hope in him. Let's sing to the God that we have hope in. O love of God, how strong and true. This is God's word from Philippians 2. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests 
of others. We'll be reading our prayer of confession together. It'll be on the screen. Jesus, Lamb of God, when you walk this earth, you did not consider heavenly equality, though that was yours to choose, but took the role of a servant and humility and obedience, allowed the rough nails of our sin to be hammered into your flesh for the sake of our salvation. And so it is that we confess our sins of deed, word, thought, and heart, seeking your help to turn away from them in true repentance. And by the grace of your Holy Spirit, we acknowledge you as Lord of all. Glory be to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. Amen. And then our assurance of pardon, continuing that same passage, this is God's Word. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen and amen.
Our scripture this morning comes from John chapter 11, verses 1 through 27. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, him, him who you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of Man may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after he said to the disciples, <clears throat> Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you are going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he meant taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. So Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. <clears throat> Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. <clears throat> But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. As I thought about this passage, and I prayed and was thinking on it through the week, uh, Marvin Bixler continued to come to my mind. Marvin's with the Lord now. Um, but he would usually sit, um, I think, in the pew right behind where Carol is, about the fourth pew down. Um, was a part of our church for years. His wife died very unexpectedly and suddenly, and the cross that's above me is dedicated to Iris, was put there in her memory. And the cross, as you enter into the Genesis Center, uh, was given by Marvin's family uh, in his memory. Uh, neither one are marked because they wanted it to be about Jesus and not about them. But he's on my mind because of what Jesus does here. And then in his own death and resurrection, as Marvin Bixler lay on his deathbed for days and his family was with him along the way, Marvin would sing again and again, Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. You see, that was Marvin's answer to Jesus' question to Martha. Do you believe this? It wasn't just an intellectual agreement, but it was unequivocal. It was resounding. It was enduring. It was yes. Oh, how I love Jesus. The miracle of the raising of Lazarus from the dead is a sign that is pointing to Jesus as the Son of God and especially as the resurrection and the life, as verse 25 says. 
We've had these multiple, these, uh, multiple miraculous signs, as John calls them, because they're all pointing to. We've had the multiplication of the loaves and the, the fish. And Jesus says in John 6.35, I am the bread of life. We've had the healing of the man born blind, as well as the uh, woman who was trapped and uh, taken before Jesus uh, as an adulteress. And in both, he says, John 8, 12 and John 9, 5, I am the light of the world. And so this miracle also points to Jesus. I am the resurrection and the life. Here's one of the things. When we're reading a, an account, a, a narrative, a story in the Bible, or reading the Bible as a whole, we want to keep track of the entire thread of the story. And Jesus' actions in regard to Lazarus and John's record of it reveal Jesus to be the Messiah who is to die for His people and to be the fulfillment of the prophecies and promises of the Old Testament. This is brought clearly to the forefront at the end of John 11, verses 50 through 52. The high priest Caiaphas is speaking to other Pharisees. He is not in favor of Jesus. He's plotting against him. But he says this, It is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. He said far more than he knew. In his earthly ministry, Jesus revealed himself in ever-widening circles. We've seen that in the first six chapters of John. We see in uh, uh, increasingly he is <coughs> both very directly inviting sinners and indirectly as he teaches about the blessings of discipleship and following him, calling people to himself. He performs a great miracle in the healing of the man who was born blind and he was bitterly resisted for it. And so chapters 7 through 10 have brought us there. And now, as we come to chapter 11, we find a miracle that in greatness surpasses any of those that have been done yet. And it will lead to chapter 12 as Jesus manifests himself as the Messiah through his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Even now, as we delve into the details of this account of Lazarus, we want to keep track of the entire thread of the story because the Bible is not a disconnected collection of stories and teachings. It is a cohesive whole. Ultimately, one central theme running throughout, and Jesus is the supreme and the decisive focus of that theme. In fact, the very last chapter of the Bible Revelation 22, verse 13 says, Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And that expression of speech is known as a mirrorism. G.K. Beale, a New Testament scholar, says a mirrorism states polar opposites in order to highlight everything between the opposites. Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last letters of the Greek alphabet, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, and everything else in the Bible ultimately comes back to Jesus Christ. That's the claim at the very end of the Scriptures. This narrative is pretty well known, and even if you heard it for the first time today, it's pretty easy to follow. The occasion for the miracle is Lazarus' illness. The message that his sister sent to Jesus is very simple and very beautiful. Lord, he whom you love is ill. There's an urgency to it, but they don't tell Jesus what to do. They don't even ask him to come and heal Lazarus. They just tell him this. And their plea is not based on Lazarus' love for Jesus or their own love for Jesus. The plea is based on Jesus' love for, for Lazarus, the one whom you love. 
tells us that Jesus is not a cold, stoic personality. That he is warm and personal and compassionate for his people. And and by God's grace, may we never lose sight of that. Even in the most difficult and the most heart-wrenching situations of life. Even in those times where we call out for Jesus' nearness and it doesn't seem like he's hearing us. He does. And he is with us and he is for us. He is never cold and distant. Speaking of not losing sight of the thread of the story, Jesus always has the whole story in mind. Jesus' answer here indicates that. He was looking beyond death when he said, verse 4, this illness does not lead to death. He didn't mean that Lazarus was not going to die, but that death will not be the final outcome of this illness. But the culmination, he says, will be the glory of God. It'll be the manifestation of the power of God, the love of God, the wisdom of God so that all people will see it and proclaim these virtues and give glory to God. And the narrative, the disciples did not understand what Jesus is saying about Lazarus being asleep. Verses 11 and 12. And so in verse 14, it says, he tells them plainly, Lazarus has died. And he adds this unusual statement, and for your sake... I am glad I was not there. Had Jesus been present, there would have been expectation of a miracle, of a healing, because he had done it before. He had healed those with paralysis. He had healed a a, a man who was born blind. But to continue to make clear, as he is on his way to Jerusalem, And the Passover that is coming will be his final one before the cross. He wants to make clear that his authority is even over our last enemy. As Paul describes it in 1 Corinthians 15, death itself. And so he waits until Lazarus is not only dead, he's been entombed for four days. When Jesus gets to Bethany, he remains on the outskirts, and uh, Martha had heard that he was coming. He went out, she went out to meet him. Mary remains at the house, verse 20. Some have suggested that Martha's kind of scolding Jesus when she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have died. But you have to read that into the passage. That's not coming from the passage. I would submit what we see is an honest and raw account of profound and heartbreaking grief. Lord, if you'd have been here, he wouldn't have died. But he did die. And they're grieving over that. Perhaps you've dealt with that personally, that you've prayed and interceded with others for someone you love dearly. And you believe from the Scriptures and the work of the Holy Spirit in your own heart that Jesus could do what you asked and that you are asking from a right frame of mind and heart. It is fully human to feel grief, even disappointment in those times. And then in faith, we trust and we rest in God's goodness even though our heart is broken. Martha does so in these words, but even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. See, the messenger they had sent to notify Jesus of Lazarus' illness didn't stay with Jesus. Jesus has stayed two more days But Jesus had said, this illness does not lead to death. It's for the glory of God, so the Son of God may be glorified through it. Clearly, Lazarus was dead. 
He'd been in the tomb for days. But how many times may have Martha considered that message that returned with the messenger? Jesus said that his death, his illness does not lead to death. What, what does that mean? But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. And certainly for someone who knew Jesus, the raising of Lazarus from the dead wasn't excluded from the whatever. It seemed like a long shot. But whatever, God ordains. It reads as if from Martha, the darkness of, of her grief, and yet the, the, the light of hope. We're, we're doing battle within her. Grief and, and hope, both realities. She's full of emotion. Her soul is overcome by grief because she loves her brother so very, very much, but she's also a disciple of Jesus. And her soul is filled with reverence for the Lord. And again, we're reminded Christians are not Stoics. The Bible does not tell us to just put on a stiff upper lip, to shut down our emotions, to be brave, and to hide our grief. In fact, next week we will read in this passage, verse 35, for people who are trying to memorize Scripture, this is the first one they like to go to. Two words. Jesus wept. Martha's is a heart that's stirred to its very depths, and it's swaying between grief and hope. It's part of the process of grief very often. Come to the focus then of this, this glorious miracle. Jesus says, your brother will rise again, verse 23. You see, the Pharisees taught that there would be a resurrection on the last day. The Sadducees, who were the primary ruling body and uh, were usually at odds with the Pharisees, except when it came to uniting against Jesus. The, Pharisees, the Sadducees taught that there was no resurrection. But Martha did believe in the resurrection. And she expressed that hope in her understanding in verse 24. And Jesus proclaims, and here's the fifth of the seven I am statements. We've got them posted in, these, in the uh, banners around the, the sanctuary, these I am statements that come from John. And here he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Both the resurrection and the life are rooted in Jesus Christ. He doesn't say simply, I will give resurrection and life. He says, that resurrection and life are so associated with Jesus that He is the resurrection and the life in person. That Jesus is the full, blessed life of God. That all of God's glorious attributes are in Jesus. Omniscience, wisdom, omnipotence, love, holiness, all of it. Paul would write in Colossians 2.9, For in Him, that is in Jesus, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Everything about God is in Jesus. As such, Jesus is the cause. He is the fountain. He is the source of our eternal life. John 14 uh, verse 19 says, basically, because he lives, we too shall live. But with Jesus removed, if Jesus is out of the equation, if the resurrection and the life is removed, there's nothing left but death. With Jesus present, resurrection is assured. Life is assured. John Calvin writes, but the whole human race is plunged in death. That's the human condition since the garden. 
Therefore, no one will possess life unless he or she is first risen from the dead. Christ teaches that he's the beginning of life. And afterwards, he adds that the continuity of life is also the work of his grace. That's what Jesus is saying. I am the resurrection and the life. Not only is he the resurrection at the last day for which we look forward, but he is always the resurrection. The moment we put our trust in Jesus Christ, we are brought out of, um, brought into the life of the age uh, to come, a life that cannot be touched by death. And Jesus is bringing Martha a very present power. It's not just a promise of a future good, but a very present power. Martha hasn't grasped this yet, and so Jesus emphasizes it. That what Martha scarcely even dared to hope was about to become real. Because Jesus is the Prince of Life. At that moment and always. And he spells out what this means. Jesus is the resurrection. Therefore, whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Jesus is the life. Therefore, whoever believes, lives and believes in me, shall never die. Beloved, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, the picture here is at the moment of death. And it applies first to Lazarus, but it's true for every believer who dies physically. The words are, whoever believes, this is abidingly, not a a one-time moment of consent, but abiding in Christ. Whoever believes in me, though he die, that's physically, yet shall he live, possessing everlasting life and glory. But Jesus also pictures how believers live here on earth every day before death. And everyone who lives, that is spiritually, we've been born again, the work of the Holy Spirit through the gospel, and whoever lives and believes, abidingly trusting in Christ, shall never die, shall most certainly never, never, never taste everlasting death, shall never, never, never be separated soul and body from the presence of the God of love, never, even Physical death fails to quench the believer's real life. In fact, it's quite the contrary. So Paul would write to the Philippians, Philippians 1.21, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Hear what Jesus declares. Not only that death, that our death and our soul will enter into the perfecting glory of heaven, but that while we reside here on earth, with all its uncertainties, with all its difficulties, we are given the assurance that we will never, no, never, no, never die. That is astounding news. Romans 8.10, but if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. 2 Corinthians 4.16, so we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. Jesus is setting up and introducing the miracle that's about to occur, so that when it does, it will not be viewed as an end in itself, but an illustration of who Jesus is, that we would trust him. The miracle is a sign pointing away from the sign itself, away from Lazarus to Jesus, that all the glory would reside with Jesus. And it is by faith, it is by faith alone, these great truths are accepted. Jesus calls Martha to personally appropriate what she had heard from his lips. And so he asks her, do you believe this? That's the question for you and I as well. Not do you know about this, not have you considered this, do you believe this? Jesus' words about faith 
and life are not presented as philosophical pronouncements for endless arguments. It's saving truth to be received and believed and acted on. Martha's confession of faith is very simple and beautiful. Yes, Lord, I believe that you're the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. This is God's grace displayed in Martha's life, just as it is when you and I make that same confession of faith. It's by God's grace that we have come to know Jesus. Yes, Lord, I believe, she says. It's the perfect tense in the Greek. What it means is, This has become a settled conviction. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Martha believed. Do you believe this? Do you believe it not just from a cognitive perspective, but so that it draws you to saying, Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. The Apostle Paul would say, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that in the night in which he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, This is my body given for you. Do this as often as you eat it and remember me. And then in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it and remember me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, this bread, this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again.
grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the resurrection and the life, the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest and abide with you and with those you love now and forevermore. Amen.